Hello, this is National Master Spencer Feingold back at the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta for that Sunday class, 11 o'clock class. Pretty big class today. A lot of classes today, <laughs> as it were. Today, I was, wanted to look at a game that I found in my own studies. It's a pretty recent game from the 2019 U.S. Championship. The players are with white, Ray Robson. Who's heard of Ray Robson? Everyone? No one? Ray Robson's pretty good. Who's heard of uh, the player with black, Hikaru Nakamura? Everyone? Yeah, Nakamura's more famous, true. Um, I've uh, played Ray Robson in a tournament game. He beat me. I tried my best, though. <laughs> I played Nakamura in some one minute. Obviously, I beat him. And he beat me, too. <laughs> I did beat him one game, though. <laughs> Definitely. But yeah, Nakamura, well-known American Grandmaster, top in the country and the world. Mostly the country, but also the world. And he has black here against Ray. Really exciting game, so let's dive right into it. Who's heard of this opening before? What do, what do you guys call it? Sicilian. The Sicilian. Let's see if you know what variation it's going to be. See, not nobody yet. Yeah. All right, here we go. Anyone? It's, 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 now you could say it, yes? Night Orf. Ooh, almost. Yes. For somebody who plays the Night Orf, you would think. <laughs> I know. I've seen, I've played white in, in the Night Orf. Oh, I, I forgot. Oh, the dragon. Yeah, the I dragon. G6. What? I'm yeah. Blind. G6, that's the, the dragon specific move here. A6 would be the Night Orf. Yeah. The most common move I in the position. You know, also, a Grandmaster Feingold, related to National Master Spencer Feingold, uh, Knight C6 is what he would prefer to play. Although he would actually play a different move order, but it would get to that position. What is that called? The Classical Sicilian. Classical. At, well, and actually, I mean, generally white would define what Sicilian it is. Like, for example, if you play Knight C6, Bishop C4, I would just call that a Sozin. Duh, right? Everyone here is like, yeah, totally. <laughs> Not to get off topic, but when I play knight c6, because I haven't studied the Sicilian, obviously. <laughs> if they take and then I take, I always find it just very awkward to have the b file open. Yeah, that's good to have the b file open. I don't it's know. good to have all these center pawns. Okay. Yeah, center pawns are good. If I had all those center pawns, I'd be it'd be a dream. In fact, that's why people play the Sicilian, is that they're trading. Black is trading the C pawn for the D pawn. Trading a pawn that's more to the side for a center pawn. You guys see what I mean there? So that, that benefits black to trade a side pawn for a center pawn. And if I get to also get this going, my control of the center will be well, pretty good. You know, not absolute, uh, absolute, but pretty good. You know? So yeah, that's what playing the Sicilian's all about for black. Although it's a little slow, black's behind in development. That's the cost. You know, if it was all good, people just play it all the time. Like, sort of do. So we get a dragon going. Nakamura loves to play the dragon, especially when he wants to win. And also especially against Ray Robson. He's played the dragon against Ray Robson a lot. In the U.S. Championship, even. More than once. So, Bishop E3... What Ray does, and this is always the case for Ray Robson, he plays the most testing, the most straightforward, and usually the most common way. You know, and then this is how he goes about it uh, in this dragon. Bishop e3, f3, and queen d2. He sets up this battery, the bishop and queen battery. All right, you guys know about batteries, right? Yeah, pieces that move the same way, lined up together, make a battery. He's trying to trade away, potentially, black dark square bishop. Now, it's here's one thing that a lot of under 1400 players, like you all technically should be, a lot of under 1400 players don't understand. You know, it's like a secret tip. Under 1400 players don't want you to know this, right? This spends a lot of time for white. White is spending a tempo to move the bishop to start, another tempo on the queen, and is going to spend a third tempo, third tempi, rather, tempo, on bishop h6, right? And maybe even another one after they play bishop h6 to take your bishop. 
So you're spending three or four moves to trade the bishops for, from white's perspective. And that is valuable time, especially in this opening, which is a very sharp opening. It's a really aggressive opening. Both sides are going for a lot. So every move is more valuable in an opening that's this aggressive. Now, it might not be obvious to under 1,400 players that this is an aggressive opening, but uh, you're going to have to take my word on it. You know, but there are a lot of double-edged things going on here already. For example, like I was mentioning earlier, black has more center pawns. Black's got an E pawn and a D pawn, where white only has an E pawn. But white has more space. White is a little quicker in development as well. And, uh, well, black's going to attack on the queen side and white's going to attack on the king side is basically the deal. Here, bishop c4. Notice that in most openings, both sides develop all their bishops and knights, right? Both sides moved all their bishops and all their knights. Oh, missed one there. See what I mean? Developed all their minor pieces. Bishops and knights are minor pieces. Develop all those minor pieces, put them in the center, and they're attacking the center, right? All of the pieces for both sides are influencing the center one way or the other. And uh, that's just classic play or classic opening play. And they both castled after he castles, right? They both castle now. That's how you play the opening. Develop your bishops and knights. You castle. You play in the center. The opening's done. They did it. They're finished with the opening. Now, these guys, they weren't, like, figuring this out on the spot, right? It, you know, it's, it's only move 9, move 10. They, they were still in their opening preparation. You know, Grandmasters, they're, like, starting their preparation here. You know, they're, they're like, this is the starting position of, of the opening I want to play. They just started here. Like, this is what I want to do. Obviously, either side could do different things, and they have options for that, too. But a lot of the time, if... Black is playing the dragon. A lot of the time, this exact position arises. And here Nakamura chooses an interesting variation. You've got a lot of options with black here. And he goes for rook b8. Known as the Chinese variation. Rook b8. I guess a lot of Chinese players played it. I think it was between 2009 and 14, 2015. But maybe even earlier than that. Um... Definitely a lot of rook b8 in this position. Really interesting move, right? It's sort of like, what's even going on here? How could that move be very useful? But he's trying to prepare a move in specific. What move do you think black is aiming for here? Oliver? B5? Definitely b5, right? He wants to get in, if he could, b5, maybe even b4 and attack the white king. White castled queenside. Right, we learned about castling queenside, right? <laughs> white castled queenside, and black castled kingside. So, they castled opposite sides. That's what that means. Uh, you castle one way, I castle the other. We castle opposite sides. When strong players are playing and they castle opposite sides, the plan is obvious to them. Attack the king. So if you're ever playing a game, you castle kingside, they castle queenside, attack their king. That's probably the right plan. And it's a pretty important plan to execute if it is the right plan, right? It's a pretty important plan to execute if it is the right plan because, well, the king's the most important, and it's checkmate. That's what, you're, that's what you're going for. So if you castle opposite sides, it's imperative. You have to attack your opponent's king. If they're attacking your king and you're not attacking, you're doing it wrong. So attack your opponent's king if you castle opposite sides. If there's anything that you have to learn from this lecture, it's that. You have to attack the king when you are going opposite side castling. Have to do that. And rook b is just one option of many. Bishop b3. Still Ray's in his opening preparation, and he's had this exact position against the Grandmaster, actually. Uh, even before this game. And knight a5. Now you might think, how can these grandmasters play on the side of the board, right? What are they, beginners? Well, <laughs> I mean, playing on the side of the board is, is generally wrong. But they've got some good ideas with knight a5. Tell me some of the ideas behind knight a5 here. 
Why do you do that? Yes? They can potentially attack the queen, and if they maneuver it right, they can attack the king. How's that? What squares are you maneuvering to? If you um, get the pawns to move, you can take the... Just tell me the square you want the knight to be on. I know you'll have to prepare it, but what square is he eventually going to? B3. Just take the bishop, right? Yeah. Just take the bishop. Yeah, he wants. To, he could take the bishop. I thought you were going to say he's going to go to C4. Which he shouldn't do that right now, because the bishop would capture, of course. But he could prepare to go there, potentially. Yeah. Absolutely. If he were to take the bishop, mm -hmm. he would not only be taking the... Attacking the king, but mm -hmm. also the... Um, Queen and the uh, knight? D4 knight. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, if he takes, he's just going to take the knight. White's just going to take back no matter what. So, yeah, that, that does end up happening later. He does take the bishop. And the bishop's pretty good here. You know? I don't think the black king loves that. Really. And I'll tell you a little secret about bishops. This is the under 1400 class. And you might not know this. Bishops are better than knights. It's like, you know, they tell you it's the same. Generally, bishops are a little better. I can show you a position of knights better. I can show you a position of knights better than a queen. All right? But the knight's not usually better than a queen, right? And typically, a bishop's a little bit better than a knight. And if a bishop's on a wide open diagonal like this, it's almost certainly better than the average knight. Almost certainly. Knight a5, trying to take the bishop or even go to c4 is great. It also prepared, knight a5 also prepares black's main idea that we talked about earlier that Oliver mentioned. What was that idea again? I forgot. B5? Yes, b5. See, he unleashed the bishop to control that square. The knight was here blocking it previously. He moved the knight out of the way to prepare that attack. You know, the defense of the square, rather. And so he's going to play b5, going to play b4, push the b-pawn, follow up with the a-pawn, and put the white king under some pressure. This is how he's already starting his attack. As early as, like, right out of the middle game. Or right out of the opening, right, right as the middle game starts. He's getting his attack against the white king going. And that's what you have to do when they castle opposite sides. Bishop h6, we all knew that was coming. And here, um, a lot of times you won't see black take like he does. It is the most common move in this position. And even though the queen is kind of scary next to the king, the queen is off on the side here, not controlling the center, or even white's king side. I mean, which is on the queen side, right? White's queen side, which is where white's king is. So the queen could be considered a little bit out of place here, unless white checkmates the black king. Then the queen is well placed for that. You know, so it's a double-edged decision. But this is typically, still, I promise you, they're still in their opening preparation. They knew this position. This is a really sharp opening, and they don't play it without knowing a lot of theory. That's just how it goes. Some openings you don't need to know 15, 20 moves, you know, if you're a grandmaster. You can play a London, just bang out some moves. Eight moves, ten moves. You're on your own by then. No big deal. You cannot do that in this sharp of an opening where you're checkmating each other. Then you're going to get busted. I promise you. And we know what black played here, I think. Right? Yeah. Yeah, we can figure that out. We just, do we have, to, uh, we have to ask Oliver? All right, Oliver, what did black play? B5. Got him. B5. Definitely. Oliver knows the plan. B5. This is the way to go. Start expanding on the queen side. Push those pawns towards the king. B5 X clam. Still... Knight d5. Reyes had this exact position before, not kidding. Knight d5. Finally takes it with check. And he takes with the knight. Doesn't want to ruin his king. He doesn't want to double his pawns up at all. But he could have, actually. But knight takes is still, I think, what he wanted to do. Now, I have a student. Let's call her Jill. And Jill likes to play the dragon. And she had a problem where 
she would always play this move that Nakamura plays here, e5. Which e5 is generally a very anti-positional move. It does a lot of bad things. In fact, I was wondering if you guys could tell me the anti-positional bad things that e5 does to black's position. You know, to me, it's like too obvious. So why is he, what's the bad part of e5? Sort of double-edged, but we'll talk about the bad part first. Yes? It weakens the knight on f6. That's true. It weakens the f6 square permanently, actually. The knight on f6 included in that because he's on the f6 square right now. Mm. But this f6 square will never be controlled by a black pawn again. There's a black pawn here, so he can't go back to g7 to protect it. And you move this pawn up to e5, so this f6 square is permanently weak. That's definitely something low-rated players don't care about enough. But if you have a square where you cannot attack it with a pawn ever, that's a permanent weakness. Your first steps into positional chess there. Absolutely. On that f6 square. What else? There's more. I'll highlight it so we remember. Oh, d6 pawn. D6 pawn. How would you describe that pawn? Hanging. Backwards. Backwards. Definitely backwards pawn. This is a textbook backwards pawn here. A textbook backwards pawn. You don't even have to know what a backwards pawn is, and, you're, and you probably would agree that's a backwards pawn. You know, it looks backwards. There's no black pawn that can defend it. And that's what a backwards pawn is, basically. A pawn where no friendly pawns can defend it. And that d6 pawn is exactly a backwards pawn. There's no friendly black pawn that can defend the d6 pawn. You can't play e7, and you can't play c7 ever again. You can never do that if you have black. You can never put a pawn on the 7th rank. So this pawn is permanently weak. Is there anything else that black can no longer control with a pawn, much like d6 and f6? Anything else? Yes? A really important square. Maybe even the most important square, positionally speaking. Anyone? E6. E6, that's being protected by a pawn right now. C6. Right? C6, that's true, although that's not E5's fault. E5 has nothing to do with well, C6. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, you continue. We don't have a way to kick, kick out the knight. Um... Is On D5, right? Yeah. D5. This is what I was looking for. Yeah. Exactly D5. No black pawn will ever attack that D5 square. Mm -hmm. Right? No black pawn will ever attack the D5 square. It's impossible. Well, I guess it's possible, but you need white's help. You need to white to capture something here, and then you can play pawn takes. But if white doesn't on purpose capture anything and help you play pawn takes... There's no way that you can control d5. So the move e5, those are the three things that it, it does badly. I mean, it, it, it weakens this square, this square, and this square, all in one move forever for the rest of the game. And that is something that strong players think about when they're deciding on the move to play. Typically in a dragon, you have a bishop here, right? Typically. But now you don't. Because remember white traded him? Remember that happened? You guys? No? It's too long ago. <laughs> yeah, but that did happen, trust me. And so he's putting this pawn on e5. It w won't block the bishop like it would if there was a bishop there. So he's kind of taking advantage of white's play. He's like, white spent all this time to trade the bishops. Now I'll just, you know, it's better that my bishop's not there if I play e5. And e5 is a pretty good move. It does some good things. It controls the dark squares which is important. He can't put his knight back here. And you don't have good control of the dark squares because you lost your dark square, or you traded it, your dark square bishop away. So he's controlling some important squares and losing control of other squares that he deems less important. Kind of tough to judge during a game. Also, he might have to think about this pawn break if he's not careful. And him playing e5 does prevent that possibility. For white, white can't play e5 against the rules. And still, opening preparation, no doubt about it. Now, 
Ray had this position before against another Grandmaster I was mentioning. I think it was Pop was his name. P-A-P-P. -P. Pop. Strong player. Um, I've seen his name around town, you know, in, in the database here and there. I believe it was H4. You could definitely look that game up. Spice Cup. I'm going to say 2009. <laughs> you know, whatever. You, you, you know, this is now. But here, Ray actually played an improvement over that game. See, he remembered his old game, even though I think he won that game. He still improved on it and took the night. Which uh, is potentially a better move. And then played h4. Now you might say, well, why is that better? Well, you'll see later in the game that Nakamura plays queen e7. Let's see, does it come up soon? Yeah, we'll just get there. Here, there, and queen e7. And so it basically wasted a tempo for black. Black had to take back on f6, then go back to e7. In Ray's game against Pop, Ray played h4 first. The guy just took it and played queen e7, thereby saving a tempo, potentially. Although maybe not somewhat. But that was basically the point, is that Black's going to have to play queen e7 anyway. Now you might say, hold on a minute. Why did he play rook b6, right? Seems like a weird move. Wouldn't you agree? But let's take a look at what happens here. White's next move was obvious. Anyone? It's a one minute game, you just you have to make a move. What is it? H takes G6. HG, absolutely. Black only has one reasonable move in response. F Has to take with the F pawn, right? Has to take this way. With that don't take with the other pawn and get mated by the queen and rook combo. Battery, right? Oh. Yeah, remember this battery? We were talking about batteries. Queen and rook go in the same direction. That's a recipe for that disaster for that black king. All right, disastrous black king situation there. So F takes, saving the king situation. Because look at that. Nice defense, right? Nice defense. That's why the queen should be on e7, like Nakamura did in this game. And like Pop did in that other game I was talking about against Ray. Now you might say, well, what about what you didn't? You told me about Rook B6, and you left me hanging there, right? Well, it's full circle now, right? I would play Rook takes D6 here if I was White, except you have your Rook defending it. Your Queen is not really defending it because your Queen has more important work to do here, right? You can't let me play Queen takes H7 checkmate. Is the fact of the matter? The Queen would be overloaded. You guys know about overloaded? Yeah, classic tactic. When you're defending too many things at the same time, this queen would be defending the h-pawn and the d-pawn. That's too much. So white would be able to play rook takes, but black defended it with, that's why he played rook b6. Question, maybe? No, um, the queen's also uh, protecting the rook, the f8 rook. Okay, that's not hanging. I mean, the king's defending it too. White wouldn't play queen takes to deflect the queen away. The king takes it. Yeah. But um, it's true, the queen is actually sort of holding the whole position together here. Because so even is, this bishop would be loose too. Knight c5. If the queen wasn't defending the knight, it would be knight c5 maybe. That'd be a pretty cool move. But okay, um, so black's position, the fact of the matter is, he's hanging on by a thread. All right, he's got d6 covered. He's got h7 covered. He's got everything defended. He's got a horrible pawn structure. White's pawn structure is so clean, right? Look at that, really nice pawn structure. Black's got pawn islands all over the place. Three pawn islands. One, two, three. To two. If you have the same number of pawns, you typically want to have less pawn islands. You'll have less weak pawns, is generally the case. And so white's pawn structure is definitely considerably favorable, but white has a really big advantage to compensate for it. Uh, or did I say white has a really big advantage? Because black has the advantage to compensate for it. That's what I meant if I said white. Black has an advantage to compensate for the bad structure. What's good for black here? The structure is bad, but what's good for black? Hmm. 
Not sure? It's covering more squares. More space. space. Nah. Not really. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say black has more space than white here. If you put this pawn up on d4, then I'd have to agree with you. <laughs> Definitely. But we we're both just sort of chilling in our, in our homes, right? White's mostly in this area. Has a pawn on the fourth rank. Black's got pawns on his fourth rank, a.k.a. the fifth rank. So I wouldn't really say anybody has more space in this position. About equal as far as space is concerned. Anything else? There's one thing that black has better than white. I wouldn't lie to you. Not sure? What do you think? A bishop? A bishop! A bishop is better than a knight. I said that earlier. And it's still true. Especially this terrible knight. This knight's awful. Don't you guys see how bad that knight is? Yeah. yeah. That's what's bad about white's position, that knight. This bishop is really good. He's got the pawns in the center on dark squares. And his white square bishop complements that. If you've got only one bishop, you've got to put the pawns in the opposite color. Cover all those squares. It's not always the case, but it's a pretty good strategy. The pawns cover the dark squares. The bishop covers the white squares. And the pawns don't get in the way of the bishop. You know, if your bishop, if the pawns were on white squares, the bishop's blocked, right? You know, imagine this pawn's on a white square. Blocked. So now the bishop's got scope. Fresh breath. Scope. And this knight, not as much. So a better minor piece, a more active minor piece, is black's compensation for the bad structure. So which is more important? No one knows. Right? We'll see, right? That's what they're battling out here. So there's no mate, so he just brings the queen back to the center. Remember I said the queen could be misplaced on the side of the board there. Black did defend a mate, so good job. I'll just bring my queen back. And then goes for bishop e6. Nice improving move for the bishop, right? Just makes the bishop a little bit better. Rook h, f1. Mysterious looking move, right? But now he reveals the point. Why did he play rook... Oh, excuse me. Why did he play rook h, f1? What's white going to play now? F4. F4. Dang, Oliver's running this class. F4, absolutely. A pawn break. It's a little bit more advanced concept, right? A pawn break. But whenever you push your pawn to attack your opponent's pawn, that's a pawn break. And you'll see that strong players often aim to prepare and then execute a pawn break. That's a really good plan. A lot of the time. Most of the time. In a middle game, especially. So he's going for a pawn break. Really nice. But you're not obliged to take or do anything. I mean, sure, he's attacking your pawn, but it's defended, right? No problem. So he just plays queen c7. Defending it a little bit more, right? And also attacking. What does queen c7 attack? Nothing. Anybody know what queen c7 attacks? It's not too subtle. Nakamura is a pretty direct player. C2? Yes, c2. Battery, right? Remember about batteries? Go in the same direction there. I'm gonna take that c pawn with check, and that's not pretty, right? That would not be pretty. So he defended it. And finally, remember we were like pushing the queen side a long time ago for black? We were talking about that a long time ago. When he played b5 and Oliver kept talking about b5. He just wouldn't shut up about it. I'm like, stop talking about b5. He's like, no. Well, finally, he's getting the pawn pushes going. If he can go a4, b4, b3, white would be uncomfortable, to say the least. a3, 
Blast open that king side. That's how you play when it's opposite side castling. That's how you do it. King b1, kicks it, backs it up here, doubles it up. So both sides are going for their plans, right? White's clearly attacking on the king side, and black's going for that queen side play. Who will win? It's too exciting. I don't know. It finally takes it. And then triples it up. Now hold on a minute. This rook was defending that pawn, and it moved away. Why didn't you just take it? It's hanging, right? This battery would win a rook if you let him take it. That's only a pawn. So he's like, okay, I'll save my rook. Now I'll win your pawn. But this is the moment where Ray ended up losing the game. I mean, this was a really complicated game. There was a lot of uh, opening theory and really sharp, direct play by both players and correct, like pretty correct enough by both players. But one false move is all it takes to end it at a high level. Still has work to do afterwards, but it's not, you know, I, I still would have a hard time winning, <laughs> to, to put it mildly. But um, I was wondering if you guys could think of a good move for white here. A lot of times people will tell me, like, the losing move that the guy played. Don't do that. Try to find a good move. White to play. Not an easy position. Maybe you guys could. Here's what I do when I look at a position. I think about, like, what are the first moves that come to my mind? You know, those are called candidate moves. The first moves that come to your mind, they don't have to be great. I mean, they can't be all the time, right? Just the first moves that you're thinking of. But it's where you start. You gotta start somewhere. So what do your instincts tell you? What would be some moves to consider for white here? Maybe they're not the best move. What do you think? Um, move the queen to d2. Queen d2. All right. Wouldn't really be a sufficient defense, but maybe you'd think about it. What do you think, Oliver? Rook f6. Rook f6, counterattacking, right? Absolutely. Any other suggestions? Just candidate moves, you know? Yeah? Um, the pawn, um, um, c pawn to c3. C3. What about back there, would you? Um, bishop c4. Oh, but we're finding white's moves, not black's. Oh. Yeah, it's white to play. White to play. Yeah, I mean, if it's black to play, I'll just take that pawn, right? Mm -hmm. He tripled up on the pawn. He's just going to take it if you let him. Now, one of the moves that was suggested was played by Ray. So it must have been a pretty good suggestion. I wanted to talk about the move queen d2, defending this pawn, right? No, not right. How many times is black attacking that pawn? Three. So if you play queen d2, how many times would white be defending it after queen d2? One. Two. 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 So queen d2 would, would be um, not a, a, a starting, a, you know, you just calculate rook takes c2 and throw it out. Pretty much. Rook f6. Counterattacking, right? Was played in the game. Ends up being a bad move. Totally reasonable move, though. I hate it when that happens. You know, how I thought that was the right move. Come on. <laughs> Just let it be good. C3, I don't love it. I don't love to move my pawns in front of the king when my opponent's attacking my king. If anything, uh, if anything, um, black is trying to break the king open. Black is trying to make the move, the pawn break, to attack white's pawns in front of white's king. You understand what I'm saying? So if white does this, you're doing my job for me. You know? You're doing my job. I wanted you to do that. I want that to happen. I want there to be tension where I can take your pawn and I can open up your king. So you're spending your valuable time to help me. That's not very efficient, is it? I'll take it. I'll open up that king. You know, I'll play pawn takes, rip that king open, and my plan's already getting going. That's why rook f6 is a very logical move. 
counterattack because you can't defend this two times right now. You know, you can't defend it two more times at the same time. It's impossible. And you would need to in order to defend it three times, the way it's attacked three times. So he goes for rook f6, but there is a better counterattacking move that he could have tried. Knight d3. Getting that knight back in the game. Just wondering if anybody thought about that one. I mean, Ray didn't play it, so no shame if you didn't see it. Well, maybe he thought about it. But it is a smart move. It's a very smart move. One, it counterattacks. What's it attacking? B4. Yes. B4. And at the same time, it gets the knight off of a vulnerable square, which was C1. Remember he was there? He, you could get took here and then took there. That's not what you want, is it? No way. So he's getting his knight off of a vulnerable square into, well, into the game at all. It was on the back row, defend, passively sitting there. Now it's much more aggressively posed. This would have been the move. Now it is complicated. You have to analyze rook takes pawn and make sure that you're not getting crushed if you have white there. You also have to analyze other moves, like b3. You know what I mean? You have to think, if you had white and you played knight d3, I'm sure if he thought about that move, he was afraid of this pawn break b3. Remember I told you I was trying to do that? Pawn break? That's what he would do. He would play b3 and break it. You know? And then white would have to calculate and make sure he's okay. I did give a variation here. It was sort of rando. But not necessarily forced. Like this. Sacrificing a pawn, right? I played b3, I broke it. Then I sacrificed the pawn, moving past here. Trying to take this. If I get to take this stuff, you know, your whole... Uh, Every, all your pawns are gone. Your whole pawn shield disintegrated if I take all three like this, which you could totally see happening. So it's possible they were analyzing this, you know, and Ray didn't like it. Who knows? But Rook F6 is, either way you look at it, Rook F6 doesn't end up working out, unfortunately. But it's really pretty complicated. What do you think? How, how would Black try to... I mean, I told you it was the wrong move, right? So how would Black try to win, then? How would Black try to punish that move? Candidate moves, anyone? Yeah, complicated position, right? A lot of stuff to think about. It's hard to even get a get a grip, right? <laughs> hard to even get a grip on the position. But a lot of times you'll be in a chess game and you'll think the position is pretty overwhelming. You know, like this one maybe. A good place to start, forcing moves. Look for those forcing moves. Any forcing options? You guys know about forcing moves? Yeah. Checks. Captures, threats. Checks, captures, and threats. Yes? You could use the e6 bishop mm -hmm. to take the a2 pawn. Check. A check and a capture. Mm -hmm. But that does give up your bishop, right? I'll just take it with the knight, probably. <laughs> so... Go Maybe. D5. D5? What is... So that's not a check or a capture, right? So what is the threat? Nothing. Mm -hmm. That's not a forcing move. It does defend your bishop, though. Yeah, that's true. Okay. You want but yeah, it's not a forcing move. I mean, that would be a normal move, but Nakamura is winning. He played a, a forcing move to actually achieve a winning position. Uh, A3. Is that too slow? What's the threat? Well, I was thinking then they would probably go... Rook takes e6. Oh, yeah, I forgot about my yeah. bishop. Yeah, Oliver, just attack your bishop. <laughs> Rook f6. Darn. Yeah. Well, yeah, you got to be more forcing. Make a threat. Take something. 
hang your bishop. That's what he did. He played rook takes c2, hanging his bishop. He missed that, right? No. <laughs> no. No, he didn't. It's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. Well, he's got actually a fork that he plays. It doesn't quite work. He wasn't really going for the fork, although he played it, and it, it is the right move, but he knew that it wouldn't win material immediately. But he's got a little fork action here that he tried out. What do you think? What's the move? Fork him. Guys don't know about forks? Attack two pieces at the same time with one piece. Attack two white pieces with one of black's pieces. Come on, Oliver, what's going on here? Mm. Queen C4. Yes. Queen C fork. I mean Queen C4. Right. Forking this rook, which is hanging. Just take it. And that rook. Double rook attack, right? You guys see about that fork? That's what a fork's all about. Attacking two pieces with one piece. Um, and a fork is a kind of double attack. A lot of times you attack two things. A fork is more specific because you're using one piece. That's why it's a fork. I'm using one of my pieces to attack two of yours. I could use two pieces to attack your two. It happens. But that would be not a fork, but a double attack. So he defends both the rooks easily. Um by playing rook e f6. Hey, how come he didn't bring the other rook up to f6? Rook f f6. Oliver? Rook takes c1. Yes, the rook is on guard duty, right? If you play this rook up, it's mate. I take this, you have only legal move, and then mate. Or I could check you, and then mate you this way, just to like be cruel, you know? <laughs> yeah. Or just queen takes queen mate. So, your rook cannot get up there and, and go protect his buddy. He's got to stay back because he's on c1 also. You know, he's got to stay back protecting c1. So it seems like Nakamura sacrificed his bishop for the fork, but the guy defended the fork and then Nakamura messed up. You know? And if I didn't know any better, that is what I would think, really. Like, if it was a game I didn't know who the people were, I would think, ah, Black messed it up, what a fool. Right? But it, it's sort of a long-term sacrifice, actually. Sort of. He keeps going aggressively against the white king. Because like I mentioned multiple times already, that's the most important thing. Attacking the kings when it's opposite side castling. How would he continue the attack? Two reasonable looking moves, yes? Rook takes b2. Oh, sacrifice. Part two, huh? Rook takes b2 check. That's an interesting candidate move. But I don't get it. I'll take it. With my king. Are you going to check me? Uh, any check that you do where I can't take your queen. Any check where I can't take your queen, I'm just going to go back to a1. How Are you, you going to mate me then? you going to check me? I think I can defend that. If you're giving up a rook, you better have something good following it up, right? Who just gives up a rook every game? Jay Ashby. <laughs> All four games in the tournament yesterday. Every single game down a rook. She won one of them, though. She did win one. She was losing, though, admittedly. But rook b2, that's definitely a move to consider. But I just think it doesn't work. But I would definitely calculate that move. Complicated move, right? strip open the king for some more investment invested material any other options for black maybe don't have to give up a piece you can try to open up the king how do we open up the king without losing material pawn break that old pawn break right i'm about to break a3 he took it But black's got threats. <laughs> black's got a lot of threats. That white king is pretty scared. He, go, he goes for this. And uh, 
some more tactics here by Nakamura. You guys ready for this one? Take it. Say what? Wait a minute, he's got that defended, right? Black's attacking it three times, and White's defending it three times. That's the same number. In my book, that's not right. But then what did he do? Queen takes oh, queen. e4 uh. pawn. And then? Rook b1 check. He could do that, but I'd bring my king back. Queen d4 check. Queen d4, fork, right? Learn about forks. If he puts this queen here, he's forking you. Right? If he puts this queen there, he's forking you. Queen e5 is what he chose. Actually, I'm not sure if the queen d4 doesn't work for a particular reason. Well, one thing is, uh, I mean, he could just take here right now, right? This isn't hanging. It looks like it's hanging, but it's pinned. Remember we talked about pins for like one second? <laughs> it was only for like one second, but we talked about pins. He can't move his rook because it's pinned. It'll be check. That's what a pin is. You're looking at it. So instead he gave this check. I mean, like I said, he could have played queen ticks and been up a pawn, I guess, in that position. But he checks and then does this. Similar. All right. Now I think he's uh, done for, if I remember. It's only a pawn down for white. But it's still the initiative against the king. Black is still going to keep attacking the king. Black's attack has succeeded. And just because a lot of pieces are off the board doesn't mean that king is safe. A queen and a rook is more than enough to checkmate, right? That's a ton of material to checkmate the king. So the king's safety is still an issue, and he's down a pawn. This was just brilliant play by Nakamura, if we can go back. Remember, he sacrificed everything. He sacrificed his bishop for the fork that didn't work. He broke into the king's side, and then tactics time. Sacrificed the rook for the knight. That's called sacrificing the exchange. And then picked up the rook at the end. And once the smoke cleared, he's a pawn up. Brilliant play by Nakamura. It didn't just work out like that. He calculated the situation. He knew that he'd win back his material. And, uh, yeah, tough to play against somebody like that, you know? Who can calculate so much and understand so much. And just white's busted now. Ray, um... Would expect him to resign, right? I mean, he doesn't even have work to do here at this point. It's, you know, two pawns and totally hopeless, actually. There's no, like, hope for perpetual check. A lot of times if it's a queen endgame, you, my king, maybe, you just keep checking me, I can't escape. There's no way. The white queen's not even getting near this king. And white also has to worry, like, you know, if you put your queen here and I check you, the game's over. If I trade queens, you know, anybody in this room would beat Magnus. Well, I mean, not anybody. But most people in the room would beat Magnus at that point. So you can't really play the position for white at all. So it's just technique time. And Nakamura's an elite player for a reason. It's not because he would mess this up. He makes it look so easy, too. I would be struggling sweating bullets here, but the guy just resigned, finally. You can see it's no check for the White King, right? I mean, he has checks, but I wouldn't recommend them. You know, they lose the Queen. The G2 pawn's a goner. He's up a ton of pawns. It would, it's too easy for a Super Grandmaster like Nakamura to win this. So resignation is more than appropriate. It's called for. So that was a very interesting game, and there was one thing... Oh, above all that I said you have to remember this and learn this one thing in this whole lecture Do you guys remember that one thing to learn? Although there was a lot of stuff you could have learned, but the most important thing to learn from this lecture What do you think? You're really good at lectures. Oh, well, 
That, that is the best thing, actually, yes. Class dismissed. <laughs> no, when it's opposite side castling, attack the king. That's the most important plan. If you don't know what to do, just trust me. I know what I'm talking about. He said I was a good lecturer. <laughs> Did you have a question or comment? No? All right. Do the full beard color. The full beard color? I had that for a while. I just don't like the full beard, but maybe in the winter because it'll be, you know, no, not as hot. Color right? the whole thing. Oh, you mean like up here? Yeah. Oh, totally I would do that. I've just been lazy about it. Come on. <laughs> Anyways, that's all I have for you today. If you enjoyed, please consider to like and subscribe to the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta's YouTube. That's all I have for you today. Thanks. Bye-bye. And you can watch the same lecture and be like, I was there. <laughs>